Now we are uh, dealing here with um, the fourth, this is the season finale of Sword and the Cross, the Cross and the Sword. And uh, so th this will be sort of the wrapping up of uh, this whole series that we've been on. And I don't recall a series where I have increasingly felt uh, such an anointing and sense of urgency about it and uh, an increased clarity happening in my mind about this. I, I know that, that this is, to a number of people, a new paradigm that causes some cognitive dissonance in their minds. And I just encourage you to stay open and, and for everything I'm saying, there's only one criteria to ask yourself, and that is, does it square with Scripture? I want to encourage you not to uh, let the categories of the culture in, infiltrate your hearing so that you want to put me in a slot. That, I, you know, I, I'm liberal, or I'm trying to do a liberal agenda, or I'm conservative, I'm trying to do a conservative agenda, or, you know, that I'm trying to be politically correct, or, or any of those kind of labels. Uh, try to hear this simply on the basis of, of, is it the Word of God or not? I want to read from 1 Corinthians, uh, two passages that actually we'll be getting to a little later on. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where Paul is dealing with a serious moral problem in the church of Corinth. And I can't go into all that now, but I will say this. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5. He finally says, what have I to do with judging those on the outside? He's saying, put this person out of the church uh, and then leave them. What do I have to do with judging those on the outside? God will judge those outside. I leave those to God. My concern as a pastor, Paul is saying, is you folks. I, I'm not going to worry about that on the outside. Think about that. And Jesus in Matthew 7 says, Do not judge, so that you may not be judged. The way to avoid judgment, apparently, is not to judge. Why do you see the speck or the dust particle, it could be translated? Why do you see the dust particle in your neighbor's eye, but you don't notice the log or the tree trunk in your own eye? Powerful stuff here. Uh, I want to quickly pray, and I'd like some intercessors around the auditorium. Can I get some people cover me in prayer? As you're listening, just, just shoot up some prayers for me. Amen. Heavenly Dad, we need your anointing. We need your authority. We need your power. Lord, we want to see your kingdom come in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives, in this church, and in society as it is in heaven. God, depollute, depollute our thinking about the kingdom from every element that is not directly in line with Jesus Christ. And give us, Lord, a vision for the purity and the beauty of the kingdom of God that we might be won over and totally without abandon, completely and unequivocally sold out and surrendered to the work of that unique, that distinct, that otherworldly, that uncommonsensical kingdom, the kingdom of God. Free us from our common sense, if need be, Lord, that we might be radical for you. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. I try to set a precedent of honesty here, um, really just being, I'm just a fallen human being like you, and so I, I, I go out of my way to display that. Here, here's, here's, here's something that's honest. You know, I, I've spent a lot of my adult life studying objections to Christianity. I like apologetics, where you give defenses of the faith and things like that. And I think I've, I've looked at pretty much every, um, every conceivable uh, objection that has been raised against the Christian faith. All the problems and objections and whatnot. I like doing that. I have trouble not buying a book uh, in a bookstore if it's written against Christianity. It's like, I got to know what, they th what they're thinking. And I sometimes am asked, what is the greatest difficulty, the greatest objection, the most serious problem ever posed to you that you've ever confronted as to the truthfulness of the Christian faith? All but one I have to my own satisfaction resolved. But the one that instantly comes to mind is the church. I know I'm a pastor. I know. I, I, uh, but I, it's the church. Not everything about the church. Sometimes the church is uh, wonderful, beautiful. But when I look at the church throughout history, and I see major segments of it today, um, It, it, it calls into question the truthfulness of the Christian faith. Now, I, I'm not going to lose my faith. I'm thoroughly convinced of the truthfulness that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
I, I, I think all the historical evidence points to it, and my own heart resonates with it. In fact, I've never confronted anything nearly as beautiful and as breathtaking, if you understand it, as beautiful and breathtaking as the gospel, that God would, would enter into the hell of human existence to redeem us to himself. It's the most beautiful love story ever told. I love that. I love the gospel. I love the kingdom of God. I love the lordship of Jesus Christ. But sometimes elements of the church seem so mean-spirited, so petty, so ugly, uh, so cruel, so self-righteous, so pompous, and I want to go, yuck! And it is for me, and in fact it is for a number of people, the greatest obstacle to the Christian faith. I've talked to three people in the last three weeks who have said something along these lines. I, 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 I'm, I'm inclined to believe that this is true, but I, 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 uh, I don't want to become a Christian because I don't like them. You know, I mean, we got to just deal with this, folks. And I understand what they're saying. And what's really tragic is that according to Jesus, the church is supposed to be the main proof that he is Lord. By your outrageous love, when you look like me, when you, when you lay down your life for your enemies, people will see the reality of the triune God and they'll know that I'm for real. It, God has wired it into us that it's by our self-sacrificial love that people are supposed to know that Jesus is for real. The church is supposed to be the living proof of the Lordship of Jesus Christ but to a large degree, let's not kid ourselves, it's the greatest objection to the reality of Christ's lordship. The thing that has saved me, that's allowed me with intellectual integrity to go on believing, is this distinction that we've been making for the last three weeks about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of God. Jesus was the incarnation of the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is whatever looks like Jesus Christ. It's that simple. Wherever you find people that are looking like Jesus Christ, thinking like Jesus Christ, acting like Jesus Christ, loving like Jesus Christ, that's the kingdom of God. Everything else is some variation on the kingdom of this world, including church insofar as it doesn't look like Jesus Christ. And it may be a religious version of the kingdom of, uh, of the world, a powerful version of the kingdom of this world, but it's still the kingdom of this world, and I don't have any investment as a member of the kingdom of God trying to defend any religious version of the kingdom of this world. And so when I hear the objection about the various people that, uh, the multitudes, in fact, the people were slaughtered in Jesus' name, I don't try to defend that. I don't try to excuse that. In fact, I'm the one who's the most angry at that. And I just say, no, I, 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 I don't have any, that's a religious thing. That's not what I, I, I have, that's not what I'm about. That's not what I care about. I want to talk about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Have, I, have you ever noticed the beauty of the gospel? See, and, and, uh, and when people live out the gospel, it is a thing of beauty. The strategy of the enemy, I'm convinced it is one of the central strategies of Satan, is to cause the people of God to fuse the kingdom of the world with the kingdom of God. There's two kingdoms. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of the cross. The kingdom of the world is the kingdom of the sword. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of power under. The kingdom of the world is the kingdom of power over. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of love. The, the kingdom of the world is the kingdom of the law. And Satan's strategy is to confuse and fuse these two together because it compromises and has disastrous consequences for the kingdom of God. It pollutes people's hearing of the genuine kingdom of God. Uh, just by way of review, here's what we've seen the last three weeks. If you haven't been here, I'm going to be building on this. Some of this might be a little bit strange to you. I encourage you to get the tapes. Um, but here's what happens. When we fuse the kingdom of God with the kingdom of this world, we compromise our witness because the only witness we have is our, our willingness and empowerment to replicate Jesus Christ to all people at all times. But when we buy into the kingdom of this world, we... we, we uh, then, then what, what, the, what a version of the kingdom of the world does is identify it as Christian. When we identify this as a Christian nation, then what this nation does, people think, is what Christians do. And as we've seen very clearly this week, we don't want that identification, do we? It's in the interest of the people of the kingdom of God to say, with Jesus, my kingdom is not of this world. The kingdom of God is not of this world. You can't equate it with any of the kingdoms of this world. Number two, we lose our missionary focus in America. Because we think this is a Christian nation, there, therefore, real missions is sending people over there and uh, sending them on the mission field. When, as we showed last week, we are as much missionaries here as if you were in Cambodia or India or Indonesia or the Soviet Union. We've got to be people who see past the social civic veneer of this social religion and see what's really going on. And when you do that, you understand that you are as much a person with a mission. That's a missionary. You're as much a person with a mission here as if you were anywhere else. 
Thirdly, we be, end up trusting power over rather than power under. We become addicted to the thought that the only real way to change people is from the outside in rather than from the inside out. And we think we have to use outside coercive tactics in order to get people to change. But the kingdom of God is founded on this trust and confidence we have in power under. The power of loving somebody and changing them on the inside. The power of God working through the self-sacrificial acts of people to change people from the inside out. But when you trust power over, we try to change the world with power over, and then we try to change Christians with power over, which is why so many churches are full of guilt and shame, power over control, manipulative tactics, trying to get people to conform in terms of their behavior. But the kingdom of God is not about conforming behavior. It's about aligning hearts with Jesus Christ, and the behavior follows as a caboose. And then the fourth thing we've seen, saw it last week, is that when we buy in, when we too closely fuse the kingdom of God with the kingdom of this world, we, we then let the kingdom of the world set our agenda. We get defined by the kingdom of the world. They get to set the rules of the game. They get to set the, 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 the terms of the debate. They get to set what the, define what the problems are and define what the solutions are. And then the church tries to weigh in its kingdom of God authority on one of those positions as defined by the kingdom of the world. Why do that? It's one thing that Jesus never, ever did. People tried to entrap him all the time, but he wouldn't bite the bait. He'd always give a distinct kingdom of God perspective. And now this morning I want to talk about the fifth disastrous consequence that happens when we too closely fuse the kingdom of God with the kingdom of this world. And this one's going to be a stretch for some people because I think on this one the kingdom of the world has made incredible inroads into our thinking. The fifth disastrous point is that the church sees itself as the protector and promoter and guardian and fixer of social morality. We're the ones who have the wisdom about how people are supposed to live. We're the ones who are supposed to uh, hold the standard on morality and, and promote and guard and fix society's moral issues. That's our job. Uh, we are the ones who know best. We know what's best for people even when they don't. And our job is to tell them and to as much as possible get them to conform to our superior perspectives on how their lives should be. And I'm perfectly aware that there's a number of people in the congregation right now that are thinking, well, duh, of course that's what we're supposed to do. Buckle your seatbelts. <laughs> and don't file me, all right? The, 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 ask this question, is what I'm going to say consistent and coming out of the word of God or not. Let's go right for the juggler. We are to be the corporate Jesus, the giant Jesus. We are to do nothing more or less than what Jesus himself did. We're to be the, the corporate Jesus lookalike. That's, that's our def that is the kingdom of God. That's what we're called to do. So the criteria for what we should and should not do is Jesus Christ. Look at him. Ask this question, when did Jesus ever position himself as the guardian, protector, advancer, and fixer of social morality? Think about that. When did he ever do that? Can't find it. Now the thing that's interesting is that he's the one sinless person on the planet who actually could have done it without being a hypocrite. He's the one person in history who didn't have a, a two-by-four, a log, sticking out of his own eye. He was the perfect holy son of God, so he could stand in a morally superior position over everybody, but he did not do that. And it wasn't for lack of things to shoot at. His culture... As much, in fact, more than ours was morally decadent. Uh, you had Roman governors holding orgies in the Senate to raise money for to build buildings. Uh, there's a whole lot to shoot at, but Jesus doesn't bite the bait. He doesn't go there. What Jesus does do, and this is the only thing Jesus does, is he walks around, and when he sees a need, he meets the need, and he announces the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what he does. It's that simple. See a need, meet a need, announce that the kingdom of God is at hand. Comes upon a person who needs healing, he brings healing. Comes upon a person who, who is uh, morally uh, or who's got uh, uh, demon oppression, he delivers them from that demon oppression. Comes upon people who are hungry, uh, hungry he uses kingdom authority to provide food. Comes upon, upon a guy who's running short on wine at the wedding, he provides some wine at the wedding. And he never does background checks first. He never investigates, he never probes. Even with Mary Magdalene. Oh, yeah, I wonder how you got six demons in your life. I mean, you know, what kind of life have you been living? He never goes there. He just takes the issue as it is and says, how can I demonstrate kingdom love and kingdom power to this person right here, right now, no questions asked? 
and then explain that this is about the kingdom of God. This is the good news, and you are invited in on the dance of the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus consistently does. The closest you find uh, for Jesus ever having running any moral commentary on a person, if you can call it that, is in John chapter 8 where the woman was caught in the act of adultery. The guys brought her to, to stone her. One wonders where the man was, because it takes two to do that, you know, but the man somehow got off. They bring the woman, and they're going to stone her, but they bring her to Je uh, Jesus because they want to see where he stands on it. The law says stone her, what do you say? What Jesus does is says, you know what? Basically, he ends up saying this. Uh, you're right, uh, she deserves to be stoned, but let the one who is innocent cast the first stone. The whole point of this story is to show that no one who is sinful can stand in stoning judgment of another person. It's the opposite of this. We are called to be a, the moral policemen of society and the moral fixers of society. Some might say, well, what about the woman at the well of Samaria? Jesus pointed out her sin. She, was, uh, she had five husbands and was now shacking up with a guy who wasn't her husband. What about that? Well, what about that? Look at the context here. Look at the context. Jesus, first of all, he's talking to a Samaritan woman. That's, that's scandalous. But he does bring up the fact that she had five husbands, and now she was living with a guy who wasn't her husband. But why does he bring that up? When he brings it up, note, he doesn't say, shame on you. He doesn't try to fix her. He doesn't try to resolve the dilemma. He doesn't give her four how-tos on how to make her life morally better. He brings up this information because he's trying to give her. He's trying to give her the water of life. That's what the whole discussion's about. He wants to give her that water, which if you drink of it, you'll never thirst again. And he tells her that he knows some nasty stuff about her, not to shame her, but to say, I know everything about you, and the offer is still on the table. That's the kingdom of God. I'll give you a life that will quench that hunger that's driving you to do the things that you do. Jesus saw a need. He would meet a need. He announced the kingdom is at hand. That's what he does. His disciples do the same thing. He sends them out in the world. They don't go out as moral policemen doing background checks, trying to get people to conform to their ideas of how people should live. What they, they've got one job description. That is to see a need, to meet a need, and to announce the kingdom of God is at hand. You can read the charter in Luke chapter 10. Jesus tells them, go into a town. Bless the houses that are there. Use your kingdom authority just to pray God's blessing on them. Oh, Lord God, just bless them. Number two, have fellowship with them. If they invite you in to have dinner, have dinner with them. No questions asked. No background checks yet. No, no moral investigation. Whatever they're like, whatever they're like, just be friends with them. Be friends with them. Don't ask questions. Number three, if they got needs, meet those needs. Jesus says if, if there's a sick person there, pray for their sickness. If there's a, uh, a, a, a person in bondage, free them from that bondage. Again, still no questions asked. Number four, now announce that the kingdom of God is at hand. Because you spent this day or this week or this month serving them, loving them, ministering to them, befriending them without asking any questions. And now explain where that, where that behavior, where that authority, where that love, where that service comes from. It's because the kingdom of God is at hand. And I submit to you that the job of the church today is is to simply do what the disciples did and simply do what Jesus did. And that is to come under people, to ascribe worth to people at cost to ourselves, to see a need, do what we can to meet that need, and announce that the kingdom of God is at hand. The year of Jubilee is here. Freedom is declared. God's love is, is abroad towards all people. And he can transform your life from the inside out. Amen. Amen. In a sense, Jesus does fix people. But see, the way, the kingdom way of fixing people is by loving them in their brokenness. And that love plants seeds that begins to bring healing and eventually brings transformation in his life. That's what the church is called to do. You're a participant of the kingdom of the world. Vote, vote how you want. But as the church, as the corporate Jesus, we're called, our call is very singular. Replicate Jesus. Do what Jesus did. Nothing more and nothing less. And do it to all people at all times and all places. Now maybe someone's asking the question, well, what about John the Baptist? What about John the Baptist? And this brings us really to the heart of this issue. What about John the Baptist? So John the Baptist pointed out people's sins. You read about that in the Gospels. And John the Baptist, in fact, pointed out the sins of a, of a political leader, Herod. And said, you know, Herod had divorced his wife and married his wife's sister. And, and John the Baptist pointed out that that was wrong. And uh, he ended up getting his, he his, his head cut off because of it. Uh, but a lot of people look at that. 
And they say, John the Baptist is our model for what the church is to be. Our job is to be the, the, the protectors and guardians of morality because we, we, we know better. And, and, and so we're supposed to be John the Baptist. Some are even using it as a model for evangelism. This is how we should be doing our evangelism. Now, I want follow me here. This is very important. To understand John the Baptist. In fact, to understand a lot of stuff in the New Testament. Israel was a theocracy, or at least it it was supposed to be a theocracy. A theocracy is a, a nation ruled by God. It happened once in history, and it was Israel. It didn't really work out very well. They had to get a king, but the model was that there'd be God over the nation. The king would be under God, and the, the job of the king was to carry out the will of God. And then there were prophets, people like Ezekiel and Amos and others, and their job was to be the watchmen. In fact, they're called watchmen. They were to watch and, and, and hold the king accountable, and they were to hold the people accountable. The constitution of Israel was the law of Moses, and the job of the prophets was to, uh, to uh, hold the king and hold the people accountable to this constitution, to the law of Moses. It was a theocracy. The watchmen, the prophets, didn't watch over all the nations of the world. You don't ever find that. Their job was to watch over these people who are in covenant relationship with God. God wanted to raise up Israel as a distinct nation. That's why he had that theocracy, in order that he would use them to reach the whole world. It never really panned out, but that was the goal. But the watchmen didn't watch over the entire world. They watched over the people that were in a specific covenant relationship with God. That's why John the Baptist goes after Herod. Herod was a Jew. Herod was the leader of the Jews. And so it's part of the culture. It's part of that theocracy that, of course, the prophet John the Baptist would go after Herod. But John the Baptist doesn't go after Pilate or or Augustus Caesar or any other Roman leader, even though most of them were worse than Herod. Why? Because Herod was a Jew. He's operating within uh, Israel's covenant. This is why Jesus goes after religious leaders in Israel. That's the role of a prophet. But he doesn't go after the religious leaders of the Gentiles because they're not in that covenant relationship. This is why Jesus and Paul both quote the law when they're talking to Jews, but they never quote the law when they're talking to Gentiles. Why? The Gentiles don't believe in the law. In fact, they're not under the law in the same way that the people of Israel are because the people of Israel are to have this covenant relationship with uh, God that's based on the law. When, when Paul goes to the Gentiles, he doesn't quote his Bible. Read Acts 17. When he goes to the Gentiles, he finds these people who, who uh, have got all these idols all over the place. To various gods. Now, if they were Jewish, Paul would have said, What's up with you people? <laughs> he would have talked with an Italian accent, a Jewish Italian. Oh, what's the problem with you? Uh, what, what are you thinking here? You guys know better than this. This is, ga- this is heathen. This is terrible. This is wrong. You know, this is, God condemns this because their constitution, their law is against that. But when he comes to the Gentiles and finds all these pagan things, he compliments them. Read it, Acts 17. He says, I, I perceive that you're very religious. <laughs> and then he finds one of their statues to an unknown God. And he says, hey, can I talk to you about this unknown God? I love this. He finds a crack in the door of their worldview in order to proclaim the gospel. And then uh, he, he doesn't quote his Bible. He quotes their own philosophers. Can, when you communicate, you have to think, how will the person understand you? You see, it, it doesn't do any good just to pontificate from your own perspective. you got to enter into their perspective. So what's credible to these people? Well, Seneca and Epicurus. So he quotes those philosophers as a way of easing in a discussion about, uh, 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 about uh, uh, the resurrection. That's how you do evangelism. You affirm, you believe the best, you hope the best, and you look for a crack in the door where you can, in, in some way or other, announce that the kingdom of God is at hand. But when you're using a John the Baptist mindset, what we've got here is people going around quoting the Bible to people who don't believe in the Bible. There's a whole model of evangelism that's kind of going all over the place in this country which says, uh, your job, this is what witnessing is. You don't have to know the person, know a thing about the person, don't have to have, have blessed their house yet, and don't have to have uh, entered into fellowship with them yet, and you don't have to have prayed for the sick and prayed for those in bondage yet. You can skip all that, go right to this. In fact, you don't even announce the kingdom of God is here. What you do is you, you, you point out the Ten Commandments and show them how they've broken the Ten Commandments, and that means they're going to go to hell. That's, that, that's called evangelism. And I, I, I bless the sincerity of the people who do it, and I'm sure God uses that. He uses everything. But I'm telling you here, that's not the way to do evangelism. Not when you're talking to people who, who don't believe in God, and here you are pointing out the, 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 the Ten Commandments they broke. Uh, it, it's, I, I, I get a little irritated when I watch television. 
sometimes when you get a person, I saw a person on Larry King recently who's talking about a social issue, and he started going, my Bible says, and my Bible says, and my Bible says, and I'm thinking, who gives a rip what your Bible says? Th that person you're talking to doesn't. What would you think of if you're having a glass of wine and a Muslim comes up and says, that's wrong, my Quran says that you shouldn't have a glass of wine? You'd go, so? <laughs> Thanks for the info. Uh, one more reason why I'm glad I believe in the Bible. <laughs> I, I, I mean, come on. This isn't communication. <laughs> you know, I, you got to enter into the world. Uh, having John the Baptist as our paradigm for how we're supposed to talk to Gentiles just doesn't work. I find it interesting. You know, the, 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 the method out there is you point out the Ten Commandments, point out people are sitting, and then tell them they're going to hell. Look at every sermon in the books of Acts. Never once do you find a mention of hell. They were preaching good news. Now, there's a place to talk about hell. I'm not saying there's not. But when you're t if the people don't even believe in God, uh, warning them about a hell they don't believe in isn't likely to do much good either. Throughout the book of Acts, it's, they do what Jesus did. They see a need, they meet a need, and they announce the good news. The kingdom of God is at hand. But the problem here is this. And now we get to the real heart of the issue. Many people today are thinking of America as a theocracy. And as they think about America as a theocracy, we're one nation under God, right? That's what the coin says. And so if we're a theocracy, we loop into the Old Testament paradigms for how we're supposed to do church-state relationships, how we're supposed to be involved. And in that paradigm now, the president is supposed to carry out God's will, and the prophets are supposed to hold him accountable and hold the people are, uh, accountable. And guess what? We'll appoint ourselves to be those prophets. We'll put ourselves in that position since we are the ones who are the, the more mature and spiritually along than the others. We are the prophets, and now we will hold the president accountable, and we'll hold the people accountable because of it. It's that theocracy thinking. It's why when we go to war, many people just assume it's sort of a religious war, and of course God is on our side. And we use a lot of religious rhetoric to further the cause of that war. Now look at, I'm going to say five things here very quickly, and Lord... Uh, make me succinct and make Susie and the children's pastors patient. Because this is so important. This is so important. In fact, would someone go out and tell them that we're going to be a few minutes late? But tell them that's very, very important. All right? So uh, when Usher do that. Number one, I'm going to go through these. Ask the question, am, am I thinking biblically or not? That's the only relevant question. Don't file me. Number one, God never said America was a theocracy, so I've got no reason to believe that it is a theocracy. I, 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 my, my constitution is the word of God, and if it's not in the word of God, I don't have, I'm not compelled to believe it. But even beyond that, America wasn't established to be a theocracy. In fact, America was established by people running away from a theocracy. Uh, they were in those state churches where they were being persecuted. That's why they came here, and that's why they took great care to put in the Constitution the separation of church and state. They were running away from theocracies because there's never been an instance in history where the church hasn't won the culture and set up a supposed theocracy where that theocracy didn't become barbarically ugly, bloody, and persecuting. In fact, here, here's the contrast. Jesus' holiness was such that the prostitutes, tax collectors, and sinners wanted to hang out with him just to be around him. But these theocracies, when the, the Christians win the culture, they're so ugly that even the Christians run away. And that's how America was, 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 was formed, people running away from theocracy. So it is not a theocracy, and there's no theocracy to take it back to. There are no good old days where once upon a time God ruled this nation, and I've already spoken about that. Number two, Israel's theocracy was a once-time thing. It was temporary, and it was conditional. God wanted to use Israel to form a distinct nation, to raise them up, and then use them to reach the entire world. That was the purpose, but it wasn't an eternal purpose. It was a temporal purpose to reach the entire world. Here's one thing that's, that's interesting. My good friend Paul Eddy pointed this out to me. When Jesus came into the world, everybody there, almost everybody was saying, you know, remember the good old days when we were a theocracy? And they were. Remember the time when God was our king instead of the Caesar and, and we, we were sovereign as a nation and, and now we're under this Roman oppression. Uh, we got to take Israel back for God. Everybody was saying that and that's why they tried to loop Jesus in on that polit political agenda. And what did Jesus do? He didn't bite the bait. He said, no, no, my kingdom's not nationalistic. My kingdom is not of this world. And if Jesus didn't try to take Israel back for God when Israel actually was a theocracy, what are we doing trying to take America back for God when it's never been a theocracy and was set up to escape theocracies? The truth of the matter is this. 
Since Calvary, God isn't working through national lines. He doesn't have a chosen nation. He's not, he's, his modus operandi is not a distinct people group uh, that, are, that are, are delineated by, by their, their national boundaries. The way God's working in the world right now, it's called the kingdom of God. It's a largely invisible kingdom. It's a mustard seed kingdom. It is a subversive kingdom, and it's carried out by all people who will align their hearts and align their minds and align their lives with the person of Jesus Christ. It's, it's all people who will, are willing to replicate Jesus Christ in their life, to love people like Jesus loved them and serve them like Jesus served them. That's how the kingdom of God is growing. And this kingdom does not have national boundaries. This kingdom does not have ethnic boundaries. This kingdom does not have economic boundaries. This kingdom does not have gender boundaries. It's a kingdom for all people who will simply say yes to Jesus Christ and belong and be a participant of the kingdom of God. Amen. That's how God is changing the world. I hate to break the news to you, but I'll say it again. America is not the hope of the world. America is not the light of the world. America is not the good news to the, uh, to the world. Uh, the, the political freedom that, that, that we have, we thank God for it, but it is not salvation. It's not the, the ultimate good of the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, and he's the only one who is. Jesus Christ is the good news. Being reconciled to God is salvation. And we need to keep those two things distinct. The third thing is that the watch, there's a watchman role in the, in, the, in the Christian church, but it's always relational and covenantal. And here's what I mean by that. You find this in the epistles where we are, in a sense, to watch out for one another. People that we are in relationship with and people that we are in covenant with, so people who have invited us to do that. All right? And, 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 and I, as I walk in life, I, I invite people in to hold me accountable, and you invite me to hold you accountable. And there's a role that pastors play as watchmen. So they have to oversee the entire flock. That's the watchman role in the church. But it is as inappropriate for us to assume a, an accountability watchman role as a church. Now, how you vote is a different issue. But as a church, as the giant Jesus, it's as inappropriate to play the watchman role for the outside world as it was for the prophets of Israel to play the watchman role for pagan nations. God didn't call them to do that. In fact, the Bible expressly forbids this. When Paul says, what do I have to do judging those on the outside? That's simply a negation of the role of judge towards the world, the role of watchman towards the world. When Jesus says, why do you look for a, a dust particle in your neighbor's eye when you've got a log in your own eye? He's collapsing that watchman role. You're not a policeman. You're not the fixer, the guardian. In fact, you are to regard your sins as being like a two-by-four in your eye and other people's sins as being a speck. I submit to you that if the church did this, if every believer, every follower of Jesus Christ did this, the reputation of the church would be not that we think we're morally superior. It'd rather be that these are the most self-effacing, humble people on the planet. Yes, you've got your sins, but you know what? Ours are greater. There's something about spiritual maturity where the farther you go along, the more inclined you are to say, I'm the chiefest of sinners, like Paul said. I'm the chiefest of sinners. And that ought to be the cry of the church. Yeah, you, you, you've got specs, uh, but we ourselves are, have, are, are worse sinners. We are saved by grace. And I submit to you that that kind of humility would, would, would be a magnet to prostitutes and tax collectors and other people. And that's why Jesus, though he was sinless, attracted people like that. He had a beauty to him, not an ugliness, not a, not a, not a pompousness. There was a beauty, a, a, a humbleness. We read the passage earlier. I am gentle and humble. That's attractive. People would see the reality of the kingdom of God in that. The fourth thing is that I submit to you, if we're honest, we just got to say the church is a poor watchman. Not that we should be playing the societal watchman role anyways, but when we do, we're not very good at it. In fact, let me just say it really straight. Almost everybody out there sees our pettiness and hypocrisy except we ourselves. You're, you're, you don't know a thing about me. You don't, you don't get into my life. You haven't, you haven't bled for me. You haven't gotten involved here, and yet you're going to tell me how to live. You know, you're just going to take the stand, you who know better and are superior. Uh, uh, you, you've got, have you noticed that you have tree trunks in your eyes? That's what the world is saying here. Everyone sees it except the ones who have actually got the tree trunks. We do have tree trunks in our eyes, and we're not good watchmen. And the, the, the things we go after, there's, there's a, select, a selectivity process that... Outsiders just don't get. In fact, I'm an insider and I don't get it. But it is so discouraging 
A friend of mine, uh, I'll illustrate this. A friend of mine in Cambodia spends his whole ministry minis- uh, getting uh, children out of uh, uh, sexual, uh, out of prostitution, child prostitution. It's, it, it's epidemic over there. Over 30,000 Vietnamese kids are, are in child prostitution. This man, this godly man, good man, spends his life looking into the armpit of, 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 of humanity. I met him several weeks ago, or I guess it's several months ago now, when I was out in Connecticut. And we went out for lunch. And he was bottoming out. He was, saying, he was saying, is Christianity real? Is Christianity real? And there was a cynicism creeping in on him. And I tried to minister to him and ask, what is the problem? What's driving you? And it, he just gave one illustration. I came back on furlough a couple of weeks ago, he said. And the Friday I came home, they showed a Dateline uh, documentary on the problem of uh, prostituting kids in Cambodia and exposed the, 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 the unthinkable poverty these people are in where they have no resources other than the body of their child and there's some American usually or, or some Englishman who wants this body so they sell that body for a night to uh, the, these people. Desperation driving unthinkable pain. Kids getting raped uh, numerous times a night. It just showed it. It was lurid. It was graphic. 30 million people watched it. And there wasn't a hiccup let alone an outrage on the part of the church. Uh, the, the evangelical church didn't even yawn. Two days later, on Super Bowl Sunday, Janet Jackson exposes her breast for five seconds, and now we had moral outrage. Now we had calls all over the place. The media, uh, uh, internet, it, uh, it just marches. we got to tell our senator, this is, I, I have a right to watch a football game and not have to see some woman display her breath. And now there was a moral outrage. Now the church stood up. Now we'll be the protector and the guardian and the fixer of morality. Now I am as disgusted as anybody with Janet Jackson and that whole way of doing stuff. But you put this on a scale and ask which one is doing more harm in this world, and you're going to have a hard time making the case that Janis Jackson is, is, is doing more harm than, than the 30,000 kids that are probably, they have a life expectancy of five years because of AIDS. What? I don't get, I don't get the, the, the sin, so the selective criteria that the church as a whole uses as to what sins we're going to fix and what sins we're not going to fix. Uh, what gets our buzzer, what doesn't get our buzzer? I don't get that. We had a march on, on Washington uh, about the, the marriage amendment thing and, and against gays being married. Wonderful. And, 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 and five, 6,000 people showed up. Two weeks later, I went to a march for the homeless. 50 people showed up, and I don't know how many of them were Christian. I, I don't get why one gets pressed and one doesn't get pressed. You know, and it's not your fault, no, no one's fault. It, it, no one heard about it. I mean, uh, why is it that the machinery, this, the, the, the religious machinery, really latches on to one issue but totally ignores another issue so people don't even know about it? I don't get the criteria on this whole thing. It seems to me that basically, so far as I can tell, and this is what's discouraging, is that if it has to do with sex and if it has to do with our religious rights, we get hot, we get bothered, we get upset, we do something about it. But if it has to do with others' rights, if it has to do with people in other countries, like these Iraqi prisoners who have been abused, that doesn't concern Christians very much. And the outside world looks at this, and some of us on the inside of this look at this, and they go, what kind of watchmen are, are these? Uh, it, it, this looks like a self-serving kind of a watchman thing. Uh, you know, the, the, the stuff they want to fix is very selective. They got tree trunks coming out of their own eyes, and they're looking for specks in the eyes of others. I don't think we make good watchmen. Not that we're supposed to anyways. But when we try to, we don't do it very much. There's a prophetic role we're supposed to play, and I'll start to end with this. Here's the prophetic role we're supposed to play. Be like Jesus. Jesus was a prophet. Do what Jesus did. Beginning, middle, and end. Do what Jesus did. Here's a prophetic role Jesus played. He came under people, not over people. He did take a public stance, a scandalous public stance, a noticeable public stance. You know what it was? He sided with people who were being crushed by the power over game. Don't file me in a liberal category here. Ask the question, is it consistent with Scripture? He sided with those who were losing in the power under game. He entered into solidarity with those who were being squashed by the power over game. He, he sided with the lepers. He broke every social taboo you can break. He broke taboos like they were candy. He hugged the lepers. He hung out with the prostitutes. He, he, he cared about the poor. He, got, he, he had friends who were drunkards. He ruined his reputation. He entered into solidarity with them. He shared their pain. And that's an essence of what a prophet is supposed to do. According to Micah, uh, the Lord says to the prophet Micah, uh, it, it, what do I require of you but this? 
do justice, love kindness, show mercy, and walk humbly with your God. It comes down to that. And Jesus incarnated that. He was the essence of a prophet. If we want to be prophets in this culture, here's the way to do it. Do it like Jesus did it, because we're supposed to be the giant Jesus. And in fact, Jesus confronted the Pharisees for not doing that. His main beef with the Pharisees is that they all had the, 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 the rules. They had the right way that people are supposed to do it. They had their list of laws, rules, and regulations, and they imposed them on everybody. But they did not, they, they did not as Jesus said in Matthew 23, they didn't attend to the ways he matters of the law. The essence of the law, which he says, was Micah 6, 8. It's about love. It's about mercy. It's about justice. It's about faith. It's about kindness. And that the Pharisees weren't doing. Jesus' whole life was about entering into solidarity with people being squished. In fact, what does he do on the cross? He enters into solidarity with us solidarity with us, because we were being squished. And that's how he affects the power over game, by siding with those who are being squished by the power over game. We were sinners. We were lost. We were headed for destruction. Praise God. But Jesus, he, 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 he was not ashamed to be counted among us, just like he wasn't ashamed of being counted among the prostitutes, counted among the drunkards, counted among the tax collectors. He was willing to be counted among the sinners. The Bible says that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's what Jesus did, and that's what the church is called to do. See a need, meet it. Look for those who are being squashed. Enter into solidarity with them. The church is called to have a special eye for those who are being squashed in the power over game, those who are poor, those who are hungry, those who are, are, are being oppressed by racism, those who are suffering injustice, those who are on the fringe, those who are on the outskirts, those who religious people cast aside. Those are the ones the church is supposed to have a special eye for. And the beauty of it is this. No one can accuse you of hypocrisy for doing that because you're not assuming a power over morally superior position at all. No one can say, look at those hypocrites. Man, they care about the poor too much. Look at those hypocrites. Look at that. They, they, they just enter into solidarity with the homeless. I can be screaming to everybody, I got tree trunks, I got tree trunks, I got tree trunks. But as I go and enter into solidarity with people who are on the margins, on the fringe, and being oppressed, no one's going to say, what a hypocrite. Rather, now I'm doing a kingdom act that maybe will begin to make some difference on the inside of those people's lives. Boy, these people, they just love prostitutes too much. What hypocrites. They, they just embrace. You will catch flack from religious people. You're not towing the line. You're not protecting society. You're not staying off the, the onslaught. You're not stopping the dominoes. You're not cracking down. You're not saying what is right. Why can't you just stand up and say what is true? Why can't you just stand up? Why, why are you trying to be politically correct? Why are you trying to, you know, get, do all of that? Yeah, you, you may take flack from religious people. But don't worry about that because that's who Jesus took flack from. <laughs> that's a sign that you're doing the right thing. Praise God. Amen. Okay. One last thing. One last thing. I, I, some will be thinking this. Well, look, at if we don't, if we don't, if the church as a whole, now what you do individually in, in, in voting and stuff, that's fine. They ask your opinion, give it. But some might think if we as the corporate whole don't stand up, and stop, you know, what's going on in our culture right now. Then, haven't you heard, the sky is falling. Uh, th th there's a domino that will be happening here. They're going to they're gonna tell us what we can preach. They're going to tell us what we can teach. They're going to take away our Bibles, and they may end up throwing us in prison. And I, I've heard those kind of things a lot of times. Usually it's a fear button that people press because people are motivated by fear. When their rights are going to be taken away. They're going to take away our religious rights. But I, let's grant all that. Let's say all that could happen. Let's say all that will happen. My question to us is, what did Jesus do? So what? So what? Now, someone might be saying, well, that doesn't make much common sense. I mean, you're supposed to, we need to stand up for our religious rights. I don't find the verse that says, make sure that what you do is commonsensical. What Jesus did was not commonsensical. In fact, it seems to me that, 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 that the kingdom of God, more often than not, is not commonsensical. That's why it's beautiful. That's why it's supernatural. That's why it's not a kingdom that's of this world. Yes, it makes perfect sense to stand up and fight for our rights. But if Jesus is the definition of the kingdom of God, and if we are called to be people of the kingdom of God, we've got to do what Jesus does. And what did Jesus do? The last thing he did was fight for his rights. In fact, he, he, he had the kingdom of God get planted and go forward by sacrificing his rights, by letting them take his rights away. I'm, I'm thinking that, that maybe having our rights taken away wouldn't be all that bad. 
Now, as a normal human being, well, relatively normal human being in this culture, I don't want my rights taken away, but here, we got to think as kingdom people. It's way more radical than we usually give it credit for. It's way less commonsensical than we usually give it credit for. And it's far more beautiful and transforming than we usually give it credit for. But you see, if the rights were taken away, you know, that might not be such a bad thing. Uh, it would blow sky high the kind of uh, veneer religion that we got going on in our culture, and that wouldn't be a bad thing. It would blow up this, this sort of civic religion we got going. It would blow up the, the, the uh, Easter, Christmas, Christianity, pray before a, a football game kind of Christianity and blow up this idea that what Christianity is really about is making my life a little nicer, a little, little sweeter, a little more complete and giving me some guilt release and blow that sky high and that wouldn't be a bad thing. It blows sky high this idea that 80% of people in the culture are, 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 are sold out Christians because when the persecution starts coming, they get running. That wouldn't be a bad thing. We'd have some clarity that we uh, miss right now. It'd blow up a lot of things that need to be blown up. And As kingdom of God people, we've got to be saying to ourselves, wouldn't that be possibly a good thing? It'd blow up this uh, idolatrous patriotism uh, and and blow up the idea that that when the Bible says that all the nations of this world are under Satan, somehow America is the exception to that. I bet if persecution broke out, there wouldn't be a lot of Christians thinking that anymore. And so I'm beginning to think that maybe that'd be the best thing that could ever happen to the church. As a kingdom of God person, you got to just realize this. Never has the church been persecuted where it hasn't grown and thrived. And never has the church conquered a culture where it hasn't died. So as kingdom people, how much should we be fighting for our religious rights? Again, they ask ask our opinion, give it. But as 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 a corporate whole, is that really the thing that we should be preeminently worried about? In the early church, they saw it as an honor, the greatest honor, to be martyred for their faith. Because now we get to imitate Jesus. That's how they talked. And they celebrated it. We get to be fed to lions. We get to be burned alive. And now, in fact, the Bible says, count it all joy when you fall into persecution. And now we have a religion which, to a large degree, is about protecting our civic religious rights. Something, folks, has changed. Something negative has happened. We need to get the pure vision of the kingdom of God and how it's distinct from every version of the kingdom of this world and be sold out to that. Life itself is nothing compared to that. Knowing Jesus Christ, imitating Jesus Christ in every area of our life. Would you close your eyes? If you're here this morning, if you're here this morning and and, and you want to uh, sign up for this kingdom that I've been talking about, to my right, your left, there'll be a, a person who would love to explain to you what that's about. They would love to explain to you what that's about. Uh, sign your life away. Join this countercultural, radical, revolutionary kingdom. If you have needs this morning and you want to have prayed for, the prayer teams will be up here, and I encourage you to come forward. And I close with just this simple anointing prayer. Father, make us kingdom people. Help us, God, to be people who have a mission and carry this mission out. And God, make it our heart's desire to replicate Jesus in every area of our life, wherever we go, whoever we meet. Let your love shine through us. And free us from the pollution of kingdom world thinking to see and to proclaim the purity and the beauty and the love of your distinct kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.